Oh, hey, everybody. It's Romania Black, and no big deal. We're just on chapters 250 and 251 of Heaven Officials Blessing! Oh, it's getting it's getting down to the wire, y'all. We're getting down to the nitty-gritty. We have um, this week and next week with this novel, which is blowing my mind. <laughs> But um, after talking in the Discord today, the the Heaven Officials Blessing train is not stopping anytime soon. It's just going to be in a different format, right? So I'm, I want to talk again about this next week, but I was ironing out some details today. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you all kind of the schedule now as it is, and then we'll come back to it next week when it's more finalized. But... After talking with Reiki, who has, um, I told you guys last week that I was going to be doing um, part 80, and then I'm like, oh, I'm going to do the extras, like the revisions and the edits, and I, in my head, because numbers are not my thing, I had in my head that there were only like 10,000 words of edits. I was like, oh, you know, MXTX just has a couple little revisions, a minor little revision, a little extra chapter at the end. That's all. I forgot they were completely like revamping certain parts of it. And so Reiki was like, oh, you're going to do all the extras the, the week after you finish the main novel. Um, do you know how many pages that is? And I was like, I don't know how many. I have no clue. I'm pretty in the dark. And they're like, well, it's not finished. And uh, right now there are uh, 230 pages. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> So 10,000 words, 100,000 words, what, what is the difference? <laughs> I was like, oh, so we'll talk about this next week. But what I'm going to do is next week we are going to have uh, the final portion of the novel. We're going to do the final extra there. And then right now I have found a group that has been slowly but surely, meticulously, with great quality, um, translating the audio dramas that are coming out. Season one's audio drama supposedly has 19 episodes. Right now this group is on episode five and they have five episodes translated and a handful of extras that could go along with that. So, and the audio drama is actually being done in the format of the revised edition. So it's kind of, it would make sense to separate the extra material that Reiki has been collecting for me out and to react to the audio drama that is the revised edition and have the revised edition alongside me to react to at the same time and read and go over and talk with you all about it. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Next week is going to be our last like official translation reading uh, and talking about the story as it finishes. And then before we start Scum Villain, I do want to go through those five audio drama episodes that exist, talk about the current updated material and some of the revisions. And then after that, we will start Scum Villain. It'll be like the first week of March on Patreon, the second week, week of March on YouTube. We'll start Scum Villain Self-Saving System. And then um, from there, if new audio drama episodes with the revised editions come out, then I'll react to those kind of like as extras on Patreon and on YouTube. So it'll be slowly but surely. And you know what? That will help pass the time while we wait on the live action Eternal Faith. It'll help pass the time while we're waiting on the third season of the Dongwa. It'll help pass the time on a lot of things. So I'm not sad that I'm on the penultimate chapter set of the book this week because we still have so much left to go with Heaven Official's Blessing. It's not over. So... I'm fine. I'll, I will be sad when we get to episode five of the audio drama because I'll be like, oh, after this, it's going to be a while before we get back to Heaven Officials Blessing. So it'll be like we're going to go on vacation for a while uh, in the end of February. We're going to go on vacation for a little bit, but we'll be popping back in and out, right? That's my plan anyway. So so we'll talk about it a little bit more. I'll have like a schedule out where you guys can physically see it uh, next week when we do the final chapter set. And I have the goodies from the novel that we're going to look at next week as well that came with the special edition of this book that we're going to look at as well. So that'll be exciting too. We'll have lots of fun stuff to look at next week. That should be a great time. But um, I was trying to plan that out because my March this year is insane. It is so busy. My whole month of March and the first week of April, I am in and out, gone because of work. I'm not going to be able to record reactions. So I am trying to work ahead as much as I can now to get that all ready. So that's my goal anyway. But yeah, so I do have a couple comments before we start that I want to kind of go over with y'all and talk about. Um, Lou. Lou talked about how MXTX pointed out 
um, Hua Chong's lineage based on his clothing and the jewelry. And we talked a little bit about this in the afterward where MX Tex is like, look, I, you know, I, I made some cultural decisions, not saying they're all historically accurate. It's a fantasy fiction. Don't take it as historically accurate, but here's some inspirations. I like that MX Tex is very transparent about that because I'm kind of the same way. I have lots of story ideas, but I'm like, oh, I'd have to research a lot about that to make sure it's accurate. So that's always a fear of mine. And I'm glad that MXTX has the courage to just say, look, I tried. <laughs> I'm not saying it's perfect, but um, Hua Chong based on the clothing and jewelry is tied to Miao culture or Mao culture. Um, and some theorize he's from the Hmong people. I probably did not say that right, but um, I thought that was interesting. So Lou had a cool comment on Patreon about that. Um, Empty Cicada. And several others, so Empty Cicada gets credit because they were the first to point it out, but um, several others noted that I didn't even think about it, and I like that Empty Cicada pointed out that unless you are a Chinese reader, you probably would miss it, because the Chinese character in Heiji uh, Zaoshi for Hei is the same character as Heshan. And I was like, oh, so... The stall, the food stall that Shelian went to in that flashback was the one owned by Heshan's family. And I was like, oh my God. And then the woman that was waiting on him to come back was like related to Heshan. And I was like, oh my God. It was like, ah, and it adds like a, a layer of sadness to it because then you're sitting there thinking Heshan never got to come back and have his bowl of, of Yan Zhao with his family. So that's why he's stealing everybody's food all the time. That's why he's eternally hungry. He's eternally hungry because he couldn't go back and have his new year's meal. That is the saddest, craziest thing. I, I told discord and the comments that I had in my head that has became the black water after the Ascension and later on, but they were pointing out in the comments that the timeline does kind of add up. It just, it didn't cross my mind that Shelian and has could cross paths during the same time period. That never crossed my mind, so that was such a cool revelation. I really liked that. Um, SQQLBH314 talked about how they're trying to rain on my parade, saying that that statue and that extra was not rainbow painted, but just painted with extravagant colors. Now, damn it, this, this edition said rainbow. <laughs> I'm gonna go with rainbow. I, I think that the marketing team is missing out on a fundamental merchandising opportunity to have a little rainbow, like colored little statue of Sheila in. Why don't we have this? I feel like they're missing out on a golden opportunity to make some money. Cause I would throw down some money to get one of those. I'm just saying. And then, um, Harpreet. Harpreet said, you know, now that you're finished with the story, you should go back and watch season one's OP. Um, for Heaven Officials Blessing Season 1 again. And I was like, I could do that. <laughs> so I've got it pulled up here right now. Um, obviously, I'm not going to pull up the pictures, but I do want to go through it and be like, I wonder what we're going to get that's, you know, a little bit different that we might have missed earlier. Hmm. So looking at this OP, we obviously have Shelian with the flower, right? Which this is so crazy. I haven't gone back and looked at this OP since I started <laughs> the series. So I'm like, I wonder what I've missed. Hmm. I wonder what could, what, what, what could that be? So yeah, I haven't looked at this OP since I started this series like over a year ago. So Shelian with the flower and uh, Shelian on the flower with the sword striking down and ah, uh, the ascension. Oh my God. And everybody, oh, going towards, we see everybody in the background holding. I know that's Pei Ming is one of those. All the heavenly officials going up to the heavenly court. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, what else am I missing here? And all the lanterns, all the lanterns, the thousand lanterns being lit into the air. And then Shelian catching Hua Chong. Oh my God, them foreshadowing everything in this OP. Wow, and then, ooh, okay. And then is that the four, the four tails? Oh, it's like the four tails, isn't it, on there? And then... They're just foreshadowing everything with this OP. I, wow. You novel readers were like, hey, 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 hey. and then Pei Ming and Sean G. Yes. Got that one. We did get that in the actual um, episode, but then yeah, all of them and Bon Yu and Pei Su. Oh my God. And then the two of them under the umbrella. Wow. 
and then Shilian and Hua Chong. And then, yeah, the Cursed Jackal. Mm. I did want to see the ED, though, too, because they, they mentioned that, looking at the ED and seeing if there would be anything noted with that. The official ending, always together. I Yeah, it, it's so funny looking back now, even watching season two of the Donghua, I'm like, there's so many things I'm picking up now, now that I've finished the story. I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> how dare. But yeah, all the little trinkets. In the Poochie Shrine, the scrolls, the fruit, the bowls, the um, the cooking ware there, and then the butterflies with the rain, the broom, yeah, and all the stuff there. Oh my god, everything going back to Mu Ching, and then, yep, the shrine, the temple. It's so cool, and just seeing Ling Wen, the scrolls piling up, all the statue and everything there. Ah. Oh. So good. I, this series, how, how dare it, <laughs> right? How dare it? Oh, uh, anyway, so I'm excited about that. That's really cool. I have a feeling that now that I know the story, watching the Dong Wall, it's going to be infinitely hard, but also exciting. It's going to be exciting because I'll get to pick up on new things from the novel that I probably maybe not have noticed the first time around, which is going to be exciting. It's going to be hard because now I'm going to be like you all and trying to spoil the Donghua only. And I'm going to be like, ah! <laughs> and you all will be like, this is what we had to deal with for a year. So good luck. <laughs> but I'm excited. Yep. My dogs will probably go crazy. So I hope you all can forgive them. But we're going to be looking at chapters 250 and 251. I, I, the last set of chapters last week, I intentionally found, made sure there was a part one, part two, and part three, because I wanted to watch them all together and read them. But from there on, I don't know what the other chapters are. I just knew there was a part one last week with that set. And I was like, oh, how many parts are there? So I did look ahead to see part two and part three. But as to what the other chapters at this point are, I tried not to look because I was like, I don't want to know. So we'll see. I just, I know that the page numbers worked out and that's just how it was. Okay. Okay. I had to calm my dogs down because they were playing too much. I was like, I'm about to read a story. <laughs> so in any case, we're not going to waste any more time. We are going to dive into chapters 250 and 251 of Heaven Official's Blessing. And we're going to do that here in three, two, one, and let's go, shall we? Chapter 250. The Ghost King's Bedtime Story, you say? Oh, well, I mean. <laughs> the Ghost King's Bedtime Story. Oh, you know, it's no big deal. Just, you know, in, in, in bed. Gonna, she ain't going to tuck, tuck Kwa Chong in. <laughs> Make sure he's okay. Whisper sweet nothings to him. Maybe do something else. <laughs> oh, Hua Chong had fallen ill. Although it was a minor illness, how very curious it was that ghost kings could even get sick. Yeah, how do they even get sick? What? How does that work? Right? When Xilin returned to Thousand Lights Temple, which is the uh, Qianding Temple, to check up on Hua Chong's calligraphy practice as usual, he was highly concerned to find him slightly feverish. I do like that they have the temple. They don't have, they have the Poochie Shrine that's like their summer home. <laughs> and then... Instead of Paradise Manor, they have the, the Thousand Lights Temple now that they stay at, which is fun. He pushed Hua Chong onto the altar. Ah, uh, yes. Since there were no divine statues in the way, the two of them often took a tumble. <gasps> what? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was the, the two of them often took a tumble on the temple's spacious altar. Then only got more worried after he felt his cheeks and forehead. You're so hot. <laughs> I mean, literally, you were literally burning up. But yeah, you're so hot. Oh my God. So it's like that moment where Hua Chong was in heat earlier in the series and they like pushed everything off the altar and like made out there. Now that's become just like a regular space for them. So sure, you're so hot. Hua Chong laughed. I always burn hot at the sight of you, Gege. Oh my God. Burn. Dad jokes. Hua Chong's going to start telling dad jokes now. If you keep touching me, I'll get bothered too. Shilian blinked and then hastily tried to pretend he was blushing out of anger. Naughty, even when you're sick. 
hastily tried to pretend he was blushing out of anger. These two, Shilian has been corrupted. Shilian has been corrupted by Hua Chong. He's in on it now and he's like, oh, how dare you? Like, what is this? What is this role play? What is this? What is this, you two? What? Oh my God, what did I say? What did I say, Hua Chong protested, protested, acting innocent. I'm very well behaved. Gege, stop worrying. A small thing like this, it's nothing to be concerned about. But Shilian could hear his voice was deeper and scratchier than usual, and he could see the slight fatigue that colored his brow. Get some rest then, Shilian said, and I'll keep you company here for the next few days until you're better. So I'm wondering if him being um, ill is just like, is it like the heat he had when Mount Tonglu opened up? Is it similar to that? Or is it something entirely different? Just the fact of them playing like the foreplay and that they've just moved everything off the altar. There ain't no divine statues in this temple because they can't do it if there's a divine statue in the way. Oh my God. Oh, oh, look at this little drawing. It's just Sheila in. Like, oh, I love that their um, robes are open. Shilian's got the, the ring around his neck, but we'll see what these characters about. That looks like, um, it, is that supposed to be Ming? No, who are these people? We're going to find this out. Yeah, what is this? He gathered the stationery for writing practice and brought it to the altar. Hua Chong patted the spot next to him. Is Gege not coming up to join me? But if you went up there, when would Shilian have a chance to come back down? <laughs> If he goes up there, he ain't coming down till morning, and he has things to do. At that point, they could forget about doing anything else for a while. MXTX! Oh my god! Nah! Shilian de declined politely. My son Long has overworked himself. Nah! Hua Chung laughed. Oh my god! <laughs> These two! These two are ridiculous. What the fudge? How could Son Long ever be afraid of hard work when it comes to working Gege hard? <gasps> what? what is even mxtx it is like the uh, uh, post in game hua chong is just like i am holding nothing back you're getting everything gege everything i can give you and gege's and shilian's like well i mean <laughs> he doesn't seem very very um despondent about it that's for sure oh my god <gasps> How could San Long ever be afraid of hard work when it comes to working Gege hard? Shilian ignored him, <laughs> refusing to participate in his games. Instead, he focused on putting together a calligraphy copybook. <laughs> I like that Shilian is like a teacher at a grade school. He's like, I am not going to be tempted by your taunts. You're going to get more homework. <laughs> now I want an AU of like schoolboy Hua Chong and teacher Shilian. Can that be a thing? <laughs> Can that be? Is that a thing? Has somebody wrote a fan fiction about that? I'm sure they have. Hua Chong flipped onto his side and stared at him, one hand propping up his cheek. His intense, rapt gaze always made Shilian blush, no matter how many times he was the subject of it. San Long, look at the copybook, not at me, chided Shilian, sounding uncomfortable. Hua Chong sighed, Gege, truth be told, just the sight of this stuff makes my head hurt. But since you're the one who wrote it for me, I can't bear to look away. Maybe staring at copybooks too much is the cause of my current condition. And what condition is that, Shilian questioned. I love how Chong's like, maybe I'm so sick because you're you're giving me too much homework, Shilian. Now I need that teacher and student AU. Oh my gosh. Hua Chong snickered. It's better for my health to look at you instead, Gege. You're far a better sight to stare at than copybooks. Maybe I'll heal from exposure to you alone. Oh my God, these two, Hua Chong is laying it on as thick as we think he is. So they're, you know, feeling helpless yet amu amused. Shilin put down the brush and shook his head. Why do you spout so much nonsense these days? Nothing serious ever comes out of that mouth of yours. All right, fine, I get it. We'll go with what you want. No more copy books. What shall we do instead? So I feel like, is this the story he wants him to tell him? Maybe. Hmm. We don't have to do anything, Hua Chong said. Just keep me company like this. I'll be better in no time. <laughs> Maybe has Shilian been working too hard and poor Hua Chong has been away from him and he's like, I just haven't been able to see you, so it makes me ill. Mm-hmm. Shilian felt Hua Chong's forehead again. Although he was a handsome man, the way he was whining made Shilian think of a red-cheeked child peeking out of his nest of warm blankets in the winter. Affection and tenderness filled him at the thought. Aw. Shilian also likes taking care of kids. 
So the fact that Hua Chong is acting like a kid is something that Shilian would be all about. So it's definitely not hurting Hua Chong's chances of Shilian giving him affection at all. After some consideration, he said, well, how about this? I happened to collect something interesting today. He rummaged through his sleeve and fished out an item. It's an old book someone threw away. I was planning to flip through it sometime, Shilian said. Why don't I read you a few stories? The little book in his hand was very old and ragged, with yellowing pages that gave it a strange air of scholarship. Others must have flipped through it countless times before. But Hua Chong said, no. <laughs> Why not? Shilian asked, curious. Books like that are always full of tall tales that people spun about other heavenly officials. Hua Chong replied lazily, and I already know everything about their ancient sordid trifles. None of that nonsense interests me, so why would I trouble Gege to tell me about it? Oh my god, that was true. Hua Chong knew all about the terrible secrets of countless political figures from all across the realms. Well now see, there we go. She, Hua Chong is like, look, Gege, I already know everything there is to know about all these people, so why would I have you tell me stories about them that aren't true? I just want to know about you. <laughs> If Gege must read something, why not pick another subject? Hua Chong said. Your own story, for example. That suggestion made Shilian chuckle. Is there anyone who knows more about me or has seen more of me than you? Oh! Oh, even Shilian saying, I mean, who else has seen more of me than you? Both, you know, in real life and in private. Tell me even more, Hua Chong pleaded. I want to hear it. I can't hear enough about you. I, Hua Chong is ruining men and partners for everyone in the future because who wouldn't want a partner like Hua Chong? Am I right? He was being completely serious. Shilian could tell. He carefully brushed away the strands of hair spilling over Hua Chong's cheek. And as he did so, he inadvertently glanced at the book and ex exclaimed in amazement, well, Son Long, I think this book is about us. Is it? Shilian flipped through the book again. It is. It's filled with stories about the great red-robed ghost king and the scrap immortal. That's you and me, right? That piqued Hua Chong's interest. Oh, what kind of stories? Shilian was also curious to learn about the tales that common people had crafted about him and Hua Chong. Oh, no. So he opened the storybook and started reading aloud. I, I'm curious because it's interesting at this point we realize that Shilian and Hua Chong are literally, you know... Uh, over 800 years old so of course during those 800 years the people would probably have made stories about them right so i'm a little concerned though because they don't know everything that we know so what what kind of stories are we talking about here once upon a time there was a great ghost king who loved to wear red although the great ghost king was a powerful man and possessed mountains of gold and silver he was very unhappy that was because he was very lonely and yearned for a wife <laughs> Shilian snorted and laughed out loud, finding it a little hard to continue. Is the lonely ghost king waiting in an empty nest? <laughs> Watch on quirked an eyebrow. It's not wrong. I get very lonely when Gege isn't around. Shilian felt his cheeks go hot and kept reading. Watch on is like, I'm not denying I have a wife. What are you talking about? Mm. Oh my God, this is going to be ridiculous. Once upon a time, there was a great ghost king who lived, who loved to wear red. Although the great ghost king was a powerful man and possessed mountains of gold and silver, more than a lifetime's worth of fortune, he was very unhappy. That was because he was very lonely and yearned for a wife. Although he waited for centuries, there was no sign of his beloved. So he went to request the guidance of an old immortal who was highly skilled in the art of divination. The great ghost king asked the old immortal, where is my wife? The old immortal told him, you and the one you are waiting for will unite in marriage upon a mountain. Your wife will come riding in a marriage sedan wearing red bridal robes. The great ghost king was determined to find his wife, so he went to that mountain and waited patiently. Meanwhile, in a place far, far away, there was a scrap immortal. The scrap immortal was a collector of scrap, which was why he was the poorest of the heavenly officials. He was even poorer than many mortals. However, despite his extreme poverty, he was very kind. Now, real quick, short aside, the old immortal is the story I, in you know, theoretically, would the common people think that that's like the heavenly emperor, Jun Wu, that told him to go wait for Xilin? But that doesn't seem right to match reality. So was it Mei Neon Ching? Did anybody tell him to go wait for Xilin? Or did he do it of his own volition and the common people just gave 
it a reason for him to be there. That's curious. Okay. We'll see if he says anything about that. But it, it could just be they made something up, the common people did, and included the old immortal when it wasn't necessary, right? One day, on his way home from collecting scraps, the scrap immortal saw a girl crying by the roadside. The scrap immortal asked the girl, Miss, why do you weep so? I'm about to marry, the girl replied tearfully, but I must cross a mountain on the day I depart, and a ghost groom lives on that mountain. He steals brides who pass by. Only a few have ever been saved from his clutches. I'll be taken and killed. So this is like going back to volume one. The scrap immortal was sympathetic to her plight and resolved to rid the people of this evil. He decided to marry in that woman's stead to vanquish the monster. The scrap immortal had two good friends. Because one was Henri and the other one was pretty. They were called the Henri Immortal and the Prit and the... Oh, and Petty! Not Pretty! Petty! The Henri Immortal and the Petty Immortal. Well, Function is clearly the Henri one and Mu Ching is clearly the Petty one. Oh my god. I, I was gonna say Pretty would work too for Mu Ching, but MXTX is not that kind. As they fought each other with their fists, they explained to him the Ghost Groom is a great Ghost King with a very bad temper and he is very sly. He detests gods. If you attempt to capture him, you will be you will definitely be eaten. But the Scrap Immortal was adamant, and thus they built him a marriage sedan. On the day of his departure, the Scrap Immortal wore beautiful wedding robes borrowed from the Lady Windmaster in order to describe himself to disguise himself as a bride. Oh, nice! So in this, I mean, in the real story, he hadn't even met the Windmaster yet, but here he got the robes from the Windmaster. I like that. He mounted the wedding sedan and was carried up the mountain by his two friends who fought and attacked each other the entire way. That part is ridiculously accurate. <laughs> Wicked gales bellowed in the pitch black night. And when the wedding sedan reached the top of the mountain, there was no one left by the scrap of mortal's side. He waited and waited, waited and waited until his groom finally arrived. When the Scrap Immortal lifted his bridal veil, he was surprised to discover that the Grace Ghost King was an exceptionally handsome young man. Even more surprising was that the young groom was also very polite. He was well-mannered, gentle, and considerate. He did not remove his human skin to reveal a monstrous true form, nor did he force the Scrap Immortal to do anything untoward. He was nothing like the horrible Great Ghost King of Legend. Which is true, right? You know, we, we were expecting in this story for him to be this big monster. And you could kind of argue maybe that is the canon and only Shilian sees him as being, you know, normal. But I'm glad that, that this is somewhat kind of true in a way. The mountain was immense indeed. And the great ghost king brought the scrap immortal to his lair within its depths. From this moment onward, I am your husband and you are my beloved wife. The great ghost king said to the scrap immortal. This entire mountain belongs to me and now to you as well. You can roam wherever you please. However, remember this. On the other side of the mountain, there are two houses that you must never enter. Ooh. But why, we must ask. But why? Why not, asked the scrap immortal. His groom, the great ghost king, answered thus. That is my secret. There is no need for you to know. However, it will be impossible for you to enter the house even if you wish to do so. A barrier is installed at each gate, and you must possess something of mine before you can cross. What is that something? asked the Scrap Immortal. The great ghost king answered, One house hides filthy trash. To open its door, you must use something of mine found on me by touch, something that is copious in amount. The other house hides a formidable spiritual weapon. To open its door, you must use something of mine that is not found on me by touch, something that is burning. Ooh, what is this? Naturally, the scrap of world did not listen. <laughs> Although he pretended to be compliant and docile in front of the great ghost king, the scrap of mortal snuck off to the other side of the mountain as soon as he left, leaping and flying across walls and roofs, and sure enough, he heard terrifying screams and cries for help coming from the house that hid the filthy trash. The Scrap Immortal suspected that this was where the missing brides were being confined, and thus he decided to steal something of the Great Ghost King's to open the mysterious house. But what was that something he needed to steal? I like that the Ghost King is actually, in this story, a villain, and Shilian's trying to outwit him. I wonder how that's going to go, right? The Great Ghost King had a head of long, shiny, jet black hair, which was sometimes loose and other times tied up crookedly. The first plan the Scrap Immortal devised was to steal a few strands every day. 
And so he asked, may we sleep in the same room? Of course, his groom replied politely, we are married. Ah! Thus, they moved into the same room. Although they slept in the same bed, and then there was one bed, the scrap immortal refused to allow his groom to strip him of his clothing. Because of this, the great ghost king also respectfully refrained from attempting to touch him. Oh, we gotta keep it, gotta keep it censored. You know, not, not anything untoward happening. However, the scrap immortal soon discovered that not a single strand of hair fell from his groom's head. There was not one loose hair to be found. No matter how many times he brushed his groom's hair in the morning and before they went to bed at night, not on his pillow, the bed, the floor, or the comb. Now this was becoming a headache. The scrap immortal took up a sword, hoping to cut a lock of the great ghost king's hair in secret while he slept. It's like Samson and Delilah, right? However, the great ghost king was exceptionally alert. His eyes shot open as soon as the scrap immortal drew near him. Even though he'd been caught red-handed, the scrap immortal remained calm. To escape the great ghost king's suspicion, he immediately cut off a lock of his own hair and gifted it to him. The great ghost king was elated to receive it. The clever scrap immortal soon came up with another idea. He asked the great ghost king, may I kiss you? Of course, the groom replied in delight, we are married. <laughs> Thus, the scrap immortal embraced his ghost groom and kissed him hard for a long time. When at last he captured a bit of his groom's taste, he quickly shut his mouth and ran to the other side of the mountain. But when he got there, he discovered that this method wouldn't work. He would need a copious amount of the something. And what, had been, and what he had taken wasn't enough. He could stick his head into the house, but not his body. No matter how he tried, he still could not enter. Oh, how, how this is phrased. Like, it's just like, he has to keep kissing the ghost king to get more spiritual energy, right? Mm-hmm. The scrap mortal was de de dejected. He had thought that stealing something found on the great ghost king would be an easy task. He had never expected it to be so difficult. The scrap immortal thought of his good friend, Lady Windmaster, and thus paid a visit to the temple of wind and water. How do I get a copious amount of something that is found on the great ghost king? The scrap immortal asked the Lady Windmaster. The Lady Windmaster answered, oh, ah, easy. Transform into a woman and consummate your marriage with him. Done. Oh my God. The scrap immortal shook his head for his cultivation method decreed that his spiritual power would be greatly damaged should he lose his virginity. The Lady Windmaster's way was no way at all. <laughs> Sorry, Lady Windmaster, you're trying to get us to have sex. Not gonna work. Honestly, I mean, the greatest form of abstinence in this world is just the cultivation, right? <laughs> Just then, the Lord Watermaster, ooh, returned, and happened to hear what the lady had said. Outrageous, he barked angrily. How could you say such in indecorous words? It's been a long time since we've had she Wudu in this conversation. I forgot that he could be a prick. <laughs> and whenever he got angry, the Lord Watermaster crushed people to death with money. Crushed people to death with money? He literally smothered them with dollar bills? So the scrap immortal quickly fled. Oh my God, he just, he just dropped bags of money onto them and crushed their skulls. Onri immortal and petty immortal. He thought of his other two good friends and decided to ask them what he should do. Onri immortal and petty immortal were brawling again. As they fought, they told him some incredible news. Because too many people had gone missing, all the heavenly officials would soon attack the mountain together to apprehend the great ghost king. This information shocked the scrap immortal and he became sick with worry. After living with the young ghost king for many days now, he did not think he would commit such terrible deeds. Perhaps there was a misunderstanding. Ah! Perhaps some other creature was the one who imprisoned those brides. Mmm, there we go. However, since the scrap immortal was very poor and had no status, no one listened to him. The scrap immortal was frantic. If the truth wasn't uncovered soon, the great ghost king might be attacked by the heavenly officials. With no other options, the scrap immortal ran back and asked the great ghost king, Excuse me, can we consummate our marriage? Of course, his groom answered with a broad smile. We are married. Oh my God! So I like that this is, is mirroring in so many ways the actual events of the story, but... And of course, I like that Hua Chong, as Shilian keeps asking to do more and more with him, he's like, yes, yes, yes. And like, it just the smile gets broader and everything. But 
But also, make note, I don't think Shelian turned into a woman during this whole act. He just consummated the marriage. So there's that. He didn't, he didn't have to turn into a woman for this to happen, right? And thus, the Scrap Immortal and the Great Ghost King consummated their union. During the act, it makes TX give us details. During the act, the Scrap Immortal held on tightly to the great ghost king for fear he wouldn't give him copious amounts of the important something. Oh, uh, you know what? I think he's going to give you copious amounts of the great something. <laughs> of the important something. Can you give it all to me? Can you give it to me many times? Oh my God, what? Of course. His groom replied gently and considerately, if that is what you wish. And the scrap of mortal said, I do. Oh my God. Thus, the clever scrap of mortal received what he had been seeking. Something, something of the great ghost kings that he had found on him by touch and in copious amounts. This is like... I love how cleverly this is the filthiest thing, but it's so clever and ambiguous. It's like, what are you talking about? I, I don't know what you're reading. What are you reading? I, I'm reading just he's getting something in large copious amounts many times over in the span of a night. What, what are you talking about? Oh, my God. So, yeah, the next day, carrying the something he begged for from the ghost king the next day. Well, clearly we didn't clean it out in the shower. Clearly. <laughs> This, oh my god, the scrap immortal went to the house that hid the filthy trash, and this time he was finally able to enter. The moment he opened the door, the scrap immortal found many filthy, disheveled corpses discarded inside. Some had already decayed and become nothing but bones. The bodies were dressed in wedding robes. They were probably the missing brides. Hopes dashed. The scrap immortal was both shocked and sad. When he turned his head, he was surprised to discover there was someone standing behind him. The great ghost king had come before he had noticed. The scrap immortal was shocked. He recalled what ornery immortal and petty immortal had told him, that the great ghost king was very sly and that he detested gods. The scrap immortal had now lost his spiritual power. Could the great ghost king have seen through his identity? Had he been lying to him this entire time? Angry and hurt, the Scrap Immortal fled, running faster with every step. Yet he ran so fast that he spilled what the Great Ghost King had given him. Oh my god. And he was stopped by the barrier at the front of the house. The Great Ghost King caught up to the Scrap Immortal and captured him in his arms. He then told the whole story at last. As it turned out, the Great Ghost King didn't catch and eat anyone. He was only on this mountain to wait for his fated special someone. One day, he was out on a stroll and he came across a wedding escort party. Terrified, the groom ran off on his own and left behind his weeping bride who was frozen in place with fear. The great ghost king hadn't intended to cause trouble, but the bride declared she no longer wanted to marry a man like that. She left to seek a new life instead of going back from whence she came. Similar incidents happened again and again and the ghost king decided that he would stay and test the soon to be wedded while he waited for a special someone. If a groom dared to step forward and protect his bride from the forces of evil, then the great ghost king would not push the matter further and would allow them to pass. If a despicable groom pushed his bride in front of a monster's gaping maw to buy time for his own escape, then he would be captured and locked inside the house that stored trash. Because many of those despicable grooms were wicked in nature, they would often attempt to kill each other. Eventually, all that remained of them were piles of white bones. They were the corpses that the Scrap Immortal had seen. As for the brides, some had returned home, some had eloped with lovers and escaped to distant lands, and some had started their own families with a different match. The Ghost King said, I waited for you for centuries, Gege, and you finally arrived. So that's interesting. It's like the idea of the the wicked ones that did that thought of themselves rather than their loved ones were all imprisoned in the house and they killed each other. So it's like... Hua Chong did put them there, but he didn't kill them. So it's like, it's fine. <laughs> With the misunderstanding cleared up, the two embraced each other. In order to leave the house. Oh my god, of course. In order to leave the house, the great ghost king gave the scrap immortal more of his 
something in copious amounts. Something in copious. Oh my God. Uh, well, uh, Modao Zushi was like, we're going to tell you in detail what's happening. And this is like, oh, we're going to let you fill in the blanks. That's almost worse. That's almost worse. Just then, a rumbling sounded from the skies. The heavenly officials had been wary of the great ghost king for a long time, so he'd seized the chance to launch an attack. The scrap immortal charged out, swinging at random, and beat back a wave of heavenly officials. However, the entire mountain had collapsed from the officials' barrage, and the great ghost king was buried beneath it. The mountain was enormous and the scrap immortal tried desperately to brace it upon his shoulders for fear the great ghost king would be crushed completely. It suddenly occurred to him that there was another mysterious house that he had yet to open, one that hid a formidable spiritual device that could surely push the great mountain away. I'm assuming that's Eming, right? Oh, when he rushed to the cave where the house was located, I don't know where that went, he was surprised and delighted to find that the ghost king was standing inside perfectly fine and whole and even stronger than before. The two broke out of the mountain and beat back the heavenly officials who had come to cause trouble. At the end of it all, they sat atop the summit side by side to watch the clouds and stars left in the fleeting god's wake. The scrap immortal asked his groom, Didn't you say that in order to enter the house hiding the filthy trash, I needed something found on you by touch and in copious amounts? But the house that had the spiritual weapon could only be entered with something not found on you by touch that was burning. Wearing a happy smile, the great ghost king said, Yes, but didn't that Gege have something all along? It dawned on the scrap immortal. The burning something was the ardent heart with which the great ghost king loved him. And thus, the scrap immortal and the great ghost king happily went to consummate their marriage once more! Never depart again! These commoners writing all of the fan fiction smut about Shilian and Hua Chong. Oh, I feel like, I feel like that is MXTX's fun little way of saying, oh, so you all write fan fiction about my stories. Well, here is, here it is sprinkled in the actual, you know, story itself. I love that though. I love the idea that he, he had to have sex with Hua Chong to open one door and to get through the filthy trash. And then the other door wouldn't be opened unless, unless Hua Chong had Xilian's, you know, love. And that's what opened the other door. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Xilian was speechless. Xilian remained speechless. <laughs> He's like, they've been writing smut about us like this whole time. Uh, Xilian's like, you mean they've been assuming we've been having sex this entire time for 800 years when we just now did? Even now that the story was done, Shilian was still in shock. What the heck is this? <laughs> he said incredulous. Isn't this adaptation way over the line? No, 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 this. <laughs> what the heck was this nonsense? How is it appropriate for a storybook? <laughs> Meanwhile, Wachong had already fallen over on the bed laughing. This isn't right at all, Shilian exclaimed, completely baffled. What is this even supposed to be based on? The incident at Mount Yuzhen? This isn't how it happened at all. It's completely twisted. And what if a child got their hands on this kind of story? That'd be inappropriate, wouldn't it? Who wrote this? And what's with all these characters who sound familiar but just slightly off? Oh my god. While the story in the book appeared to be sweet and innocent at first glance, like a child's bedtime story, upon closer inspection the plot was incredibly over the top, and it was even more depraved than an ordinary spicy story. I Here's the thing. I think it's also MXTX making a comment about saying, you know, if you're taking your kids to buy this at the store, you might want to think twice. <laughs> oh my god. Yet... There was a peculiar sort of sentimentality at the conclusion, and Shilian wondered if there was something wrong with him for being feeling moved by it. Hua Chong chimed in with his own thoughts. Hmm, it's not entirely twisted. Some parts are correct, at least. For example, I certainly do call you Gege. <laughs> and it certainly was me who went to receive your wedding sedan. And on the night we consummated our marriage, you certainly did. Oh my god! <gasps> Oh, Shilian had thought he'd built up a thick skin after all these years. After all these years, 
yet he still constantly flushed bright red in front of Hua Chong. How did they know something like that? Shi Lian exclaimed. Uh, aside from that, it went all wrong. It was all wrong. Although he knew it was normal for there to be leagues of difference between folk tales and their factual origins, after countless adaptations and rewrites, strange results were hardly unexpected. Seeing it for himself still shocked him to the extreme. There had been several points when he'd been too mortified to keep reading, but Hua Chong had forced him to continue. How aggravating. <laughs> oh, how desperately Shi Lian wanted to beat him up, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. He's supposed to be sick, remember? Oh my god. Hua Chong didn't find it surprising either. Obviously, someone involved must have leaked details about the incident. Some rearrangements here, some wrongful conclusions there, and a sprinkle of conjecture on top, and voila, there you have it. No more reading rubbish books like this, Shilian said, tossing the storybook aside. It's time to rest properly. However, Hua Chong only clapped. But it was so well written, the writer's very talented. Then he pleaded. Listening to it made me feel so much better. Won't you read me another, Gege? No. Shilian refused resolutely. I just, I love it. I love the idea. So, so they have consummated, you know, their wedding night. How dare you not give us that MXTX? How dare you not give us that moment? That's the one thing. Like we, Modao Zushi, you see the moment it happens. It's like, yes. But here it's like, you won't tell us about their wedding night? How dare you? How dare you, MXTX? How dare you not give us that? Maybe it'll be in the revisions. Don't answer that question. I'm going to get to the revisions. Maybe it'll be in there, right? Gege, my head hurts. But, Gege, all right, fine. It was rare for Hua Chong to fall ill, even slightly. And even in the best of times, Shilin usually went along with his every whim and granted every single one of his wishes. How could he resist him at a time like this? Thus, as mortified as he was, he swallowed down his embarrassment and picked up that pervy little book anew. <laughs> that pervy little book anew! He lay down next to Hua Chong, whose arm immediately circled around his waist as he did and forced him to keep reading. Oh, that, that gets me. Like the idea of Hua Chong, like sliding his wet arm around Shilian's waist and like pulling him close to me, like read me a story, Gege. Shut up. Once upon a time, there was a handsome young crown prince who cultivated deep in the mountains. One night, he was greeted by a mysterious guest. Oh, I'm glad we still have another, yeah, we still have another chapter to go. This was just chapter 250, but oh my God, I just, I, mm, mm, MXTX, you, you. I love it. I love how much Shilian, I don't want to say grown because I know everybody will be like, <laughs> but I love, it is true. It's like Shilian has he's grown as a character and even though he still gets red and flustered and he like is like oh, i don't know what i don't want to talk about this the fact of the matter is him and him and watchong have had sex and now he's just like you know watchong is watchong is just he's milking it for all it's worth he's like he loves getting on shilian's goat and he loves just like pestering him shilian's like oh i can take it but uh it is such a great dynamic i love it love it so now we have uh, extra number four um, chapter 1, 251. Oh, goodness. The Cave of 10,000 Gods. <gasps> oh, are we going to find out um, what the murals are? Are we going to find out the murals? Yes, please. Can we please find out the murals? That'd be really good. I would be all about that. Laughing, Shilian pushed Hua Chong off of him. His crushing weight was making it hard to breathe. The heat and passion had yet to subside when suddenly, suddenly, something occurred to him. Wait! What? Are you... You start a chapter at the end of a sex scene? Excuse me? Because, yeah, he says, laughing, Shilian pulled what pushed Hua Chong off of him. How dare! The heat and passion had yet to subside when suddenly, something occurred to him. Oh, yes, on Long. He began offhandedly. About the Cave of Ten Thousand Gods. Hmm... Hua Chong replied lazily as he settled his arm over Shilian's chest. Once something in particular was in his clutches, his fingers began to twiddle and toy with it. What about it? Oh my god, like this like post-coital scene between them. And you don't show us the scene, MXTX? How dare you? How dare you? Nothing, Shilian said. It just suddenly occurred to me 
Are the divine statues inside the cave all right after Mount Tonglu's eruption? It would be such a shame if anything happened to them. After all, every statue in there was the product of Hua Chong's blood, sweat, and tears. And Shilian loved them all. They'll be fine, Hua Chong said. I set up a ward a long time ago. The cave would remain intact even if the entire mountain collapsed. Really? This piqued Shilian's interest. They must be fine then. What a relief. I, I want to go and take a look at them. Is that okay? Hua Chong's expression seemed to falter for a moment before he quickly painted over it with a smile. Oh, oh sure, Gege, he agreed. You you can go if you want. What's stopping you? <laughs> well, let's go tomorrow, Shilian exclaimed. The Tonglu area is open now, so we can head out anytime we want. Oh, Hua Chong's like, you know, I set up a way, um, I set up a defense system for my shrine because it's my shrine and I've spent a lot of time on it, but I don't really want, are you sure you want to go back there? I mean, we don't have to go back there and see it. It's kind of embarrassing. It's sort of cringy and secondhand embarrassment. I don't know, what, why are we going back there? <laughs> That's the impression that I get. Watch on quirked an eyebrow. Tomorrow? All right. He didn't object to the suggestion, nor did he speak more on the subject. A moment later, however, he flipped Shilian onto his stomach. And he climbed on top of him again. What? Oh my god, what? Maybe it was Shilian's imagination. But Watch Chong seemed to work him... Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Maybe it was Shilian's imagination, but Hua Chong seemed to work him even harder and more aggressively the second half of the night. It wasn't even two more rounds before he was forced to cry, Gege, help me! And woozily passed out. It's like MXTX going a whole different route with this in that like I said, Modazushi, you explicitly know every minute detail of what is happening between Wei Wuxian and Lan Wanji in that moment. Here, it's just so minimal. And MX6 is like, oh, yes, yeah, no, he just shoved Shilin on his stomach and got behind him and just, you know, took him from behind. That's all. And you're like, that is not all. <laughs> he might have slept soundly until the next morning, but the two, but not two hours later. Shilian felt a void next to him, even deep in slumber. Oh, he tried to, he tried to like do him good so he'd sleep through the day and, and so he could go make to the man, to the mountain. Uh-huh. He opened his eyes a slit and peered to the spot beside him only to find that the man next to him was missing. Surprised, Shilian sat up at once, any drowsiness leaving him completely. After quickly making himself decent, he slowly rolled out of bed and as he pushed the door to head out, he wondered, where did San Long go? This was the first time that Hua Chong had ever gone missing halfway through the night. Shilian searched all of Paradise Manor, but found no sign of him. Okay, so Paradise Manor does exist. Okay, so they rebuilt Paradise Manor. They rebuilt the Poochie Shrine. They have a summer home, a fall home, and they have the Chanding Temple. They can just do it everywhere. Rule of three. You got three different places, right? Hmm. Shilian searched all of Paradise Manor, but found no sign of him. Suddenly, he remembered that there was a room in the manor used for teleportation. When he went there, sure enough, the door of the room had been left ajar. The array on the door wasn't the same as the one he remembered from the last time he'd come here, and the cinnabar of the new array had yet to dry. Shilian went in without a second thought, and when he emerged, it was no longer Paradise Manor. Instead, there was nothing but darkness. Shilian closed the door and ignited a palm torch to illuminate his surroundings, and when he took in the sight before him, he was shocked. The teleportation array was connected to an enormous eerie cavern. It was the cave of 10,000 gods. Why had Hua Chong come here alone in the middle of the night? Didn't they argue to go together the next day? Why had he made this trip alone and in secret? Shilian shook his head. With a torch in hand, he started to slowly walk the dim, chilly tunnels. His footsteps echoed hauntingly. The light silk veils covering the divine statues had been removed, so countless silent faces that mirrored his own stared out from the encompass encompassing darkness. It was somewhat of a terrifying sight if he thought about it. When Shilian passed a cavern and glanced in absentmindedly, he saw a divine statue of the God-pleasing crown prince. Its expression was gentle and its form graceful as it stood there, flower in one hand and sword in the other. There were hundreds of divine statues here, if not thousands. Who knew how much time and effort it had taken to carve them, or how much time he had spent in this silent darkness? As he thought of that, 
Chilean let out a sigh. Approaching the statue, he inclined his head and murmured, It must have been lonely, huh? He was talking about the sculptor, but the statues as well. The God-pleasing Crown Prince statue nodded. Well, that was terrifying! Oh, so they can nod? What? Also, it is really sad. I'm glad Shilian is reflecting on the fact that Hua Chong was here carving these statues all this time and how lonely that would have been while he was thinking about Shilian. How far Hua Chong has come as well from making all these statues to being with the real thing. But why did it nod its head? That is terrifying. Shilian remained frozen stiff for a while before he realized what had happened. Because he had been, oh my God. Because he had been recharged with spiritual power very recently, the brimming abundance of it coursing through him had most likely affected the statues and made them move. Oh my god, MXTX. I like that basically to recharge Shelian's batteries as a heavenly official, they literally have to be like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> right? What the fudge? He quickly reigned in his spiritual power, but it was too late. The God-pleasing crown prince had already taken a step forward. Although Shelian's overflowing spiritual power had affected the statue, he made no attempt to issue it any commands, so its movements were slightly awkward. It tripped and fell with a thud. Oh, be careful, cried Shelian as he rushed over to help it stand. After being helped to its feet, the divine statue's smile did not falter. It even lifted its chin with lofty dignity and nodded to him to express its thanks. Shilin couldn't help but find its haughtiness funny, but he held back his mirth. Did you see Hua Chong? Shilin asked. Divine statues can make simple sounds but cannot speak, except for representations of the silver-tongued gods who govern speech-related arts. Oh, okay. So only a certain type of heavenly official could create a statue that could talk. Interesting. When the god-pleasing crown prince heard his question, slight confusion colored its face, as if it didn't know who he was talking about. Shilian understood immediately. He hadn't met Hua Chong yet at that period in his life depicted by the statue. Oh! Shilian reworded the question. Have you seen a man dressed in red? Only then did the divine statue produce a full smile accompanied by an aloof nod. Do you know where he went? Shilian asked. After all, he wasn't familiar with this massive cavern and was afraid of getting lost. The statue thought for a moment before pointing him in the right direction. Oh, well, thank you, your highness, Shilian said. After walking along a stretch of road for a bit, he looked back. The god-pleasing crown prince statue had mastered the essentials of walking quite quickly and had started performing a sword dance right there in the road. Its form was divinely graceful, as though it was the center stage at the Shangyang Heavenly Ceremonial Procession, dancing above a captivated crowd. Too bad there was no audience to appreciate its efforts. Not long after, Shilian hit another fork in the road. Without pausing, he entered the nearest cavern, ready to ask for help from one, another one of the statues. When he entered, he saw a figure sitting on the stone altar, hugging a liquor jug and vigorously chugging its contents. Shilian was speechless for a moment and dashed forward to snatch the jug away. Oh, stop, he exclaimed. This divine statue was also made in his likeliness, except with a thinner face and plain white robes no longer extravagant. After Shilian took away the liquor jug, the statue tried to snatch it back, but its strength in its dazed state was no match for his own. Its attempts sent it spinning in circles, and then suddenly it clung to Shilian and began to cry in frustration. Shilian gaped. There's no need for you to cry either. The statue sobbed even harder at this. It cried like a man with infinite problems. It stopped grabbing for the liquor and instead clutched Shilian and refused to let go. So we're going through all the different forms that Hua Chong has seen Shilian. He saw him as the child, you know, saving him in, during the grand martial ceremony. And now he sees him when he was in the graveyard drinking when he was the ghost fire. Shilian had no idea he was so clingy when he got drunk. He had no choice but to hug it and gently, gently rub its back. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. He soothed. Yeah, it's like Shilian's like, oh, I was like this. Oh, my gosh. On second glance, Shilian realized that the liquor jug in his hand didn't have any alcohol in it, so it didn't matter if he returned it. He asked, have you seen a man dressed in red? Where did he go? The divine statue pointed him in the right direction, and Shilian returned the liquor jug. As he continued on his way, the statue stopped crying. It sat back on the ground, hugging the jug, and drifted into a dreamy distraction. Shilian looked back and let out a sigh and moved on.
Uh, and to think that that was like, well, that wasn't the worst. That wasn't the worst version of him that he didn't want Hua Chong to see, but that was one of the worst versions. Now he's just like, glad we moved on from that. <laughs> After walking for a while, he heard a sound like a creaking friction of metal chains. And he soon came into a spacious cavern. A swing hung from the dome ceiling of the cave and a divine statue was seated upon it. It was sprightly and filled with the air of youth and it wore a cultivation uniform of a royal cultivation hall disciple. This was probably him at 16 or 17. It was gripping the swing's chains and pulling on them hard to make it rock back and forth, but it kept failing because he was sitting on it. It wore a troubled expression, clearly upset by its plight. Which, oh my god, the last episode of the Dongwa now that had the swing and the kids swinging from it and then you see the swing broken. Referencing back to this. At the sight of this, Shilian went over to give it a push or two. The swing finally began to move which made the statue and cultivation robes happy. Shilin took this chance to ask, have you seen a man dressed in red? Where did he go? The statue and cultivation robes pointed in one direction, his other hand still holding the swing's chain. Shilin gave it another few pushes before he said, goodbye then. The swing rocked back and forth dozens of times but eventually came to a stop once more. Without anyone to push him, the statue and cultivation robes sat there in a daze. The troubled expression returned and resurfaced on its face. Also, that's so creepy. It's so creepy to see, like, as he's walking away, he looks back and sees the statue just sitting there, not knowing what to do since nobody's there to push him. But it also reminds me of Bai Wu Shang in the swing. So that is creepy. What? I should reach him soon, right? Shillian thought as he walked on and on. Just then, he heard a small voice that sounded like it was suppressing pain. Confused, he wondered aloud, What's that sound? Gasping? A voice was coming from a cavern just ahead. When Shilian went in, he saw a stone altar with what appeared to be a divine statue lying on top. Oof. A sheer white cloth covered it from head to toe and draped down the altar to brush the ground. The figure beneath the silk was writhing in shadowed contour, at times curling into a ball and at times tossing and turning. It looked like someone struggling painfully and suffering grave torment. And of course, Hua Chong didn't want to see this after he built it, so he put a sheet over it to not be able to watch it again. Mm. Speechless, Shillian was just about to go over and pull off the white sheet when a hand reached out from behind him and covered his eyes. Because Hua Chong's like, I don't want you to see this. Gege, sighed a low voice, also from behind him. Shilian chuckled. So how long do you think I don't know what this is, even if you don't let me see it? He asked gently. After a long silence, another sigh escaped Hua Chong. Gege, I was wrong. Shilian pulled down his hand and looked back to face him. The land of the tenders. Oh, I thought it was the altar where he got stabbed, but no, this was him hurting himself in the cave. The one standing behind him was a tall man dressed in red, and it was, of course, Hua Chong. Now that he'd been caught, he raised one hand to hold his troubled brow. Yes, he finally admitted. No wonder. If that's what it was, it was no surprise that Hua Chong wouldn't let him look at the statue. You came here tonight hoping to hide this statue, didn't you? Chilean asked. Hua Chong's gaze shifted elsewhere as he answered, yes. Was that the only one? Shilian didn't know where to laugh or cry. Was Hua Chong really so afraid of letting him see it? Why hide it, he asked. It's not that big of a deal, really. But now we have a troublesome problem on our hands. The troublesome problem being that Shilian's arrival had unintentionally animated all the divine statues. It really wasn't too much of a concern, but to this statue in peculiar, it was an agonizing affair. For the sculpted idol beneath the silk cover was a depiction of the 17-year-old Shi Lian who had been poisoned by the land of the tenders inside the cave out in the wilderness. The other divine statues depicted sword dancing or drinking or swinging on a swing, all of that and more. This one, however, was the unfortunate representative of the time Shi Lian had been laid low by the dreadful flower Yao's poison. So when it came alive, it had to suffer the grave torment of the poison of desire. The agonizing gasping from under the sheer cloth was unbearable to hear. It forced Chilean's mind back to that harrowing, torrid night. 
It's awful what it's going through right now, Shelian said. If I leave, will it return to being a simple stone statue? If it did, it wouldn't need to suffer further torture. I'm afraid not, Huachong replied. Gege, you're in pretty much your most powerful state right now. Every divine statue in the Cave of Ten Thousand Gods has been affected by you, and they will remain animated for a long time even if you leave. It wouldn't be right to simply abandon the statue to its pain. Then is there any other way? Shilian asked. Indeed, Hua Chong was a man of ways. <laughs> with a slight nod, he said, I was just attending to this matter. Come with me, Gege. He led Shilian to a different stone cavern, and Shilian's eyes widened when they entered the room. Inside stood a stone sculpture of a man, tall and slender, with a handsome face and lips that curled slightly upward. Is he going to make this statue of Hua Chong come alive so it can have sex with the statue in the land of the tender? Wait, what? An eye patch covered its right eye. The statue was almost an exact replica of the red-clad man who'd led him here. It was the Ghost King statue. Well, this is... Shillian trailed off. Something I carved in a hurry when I realized things were going wrong, Hua Chong explained. I haven't sculpted in years, so I'm a little rusty. Gege, look, does it look like me? After examining it in detail, Shilian declared, Well, very much so, but... But what? Hua Chong asked. Shilian grinned. It doesn't look quite as good as the original. Ah! Hua Chong smiled as well, and then Shilian returned to the subject. So, Sun Long, the idea you mentioned is... Was it to have this Ghost King statue help detoxify... The divine statue poisoned by the land of the tenders? After a brief silence, Hua Chong's smile disappeared and his expression went serious. He looked Shilian in the eyes and stated, yes. Shilian hadn't noticed the caution in his expression and thought, this idea is too much. Although it certainly was an effective way to get to the root of the problem, just the thought of it was absurd and ridiculously debauched. To put it bluntly, were they really planning on suppressing the poison of desire by using the Ghost King statue to take the virginity of this young divine statue? Honestly, it was hard to even talk about. Oh my god, this is the incense chapter. <laughs> this is the incense chapter part two. Not last week. It's this one. Oh my god. Oh, because in Modao Zushi, there's an incense chapter where, like, a younger version of them, of each of Wang Shen, gets with the younger version of the other one, and the other two watch, and there's, like, this voyeurism to it, and it's, this is that, right? And I like that Hua Chong is not just like, yeah, let's do this. He's, Hua Chong, clearly the idea is something Hua Chong doesn't like to think of, because it's, it's doing something with his gege that's beyond his gege's control. So he's like, I don't want to do this, but this is all I can think of. So what do we do about that? Shilian was still at a loss for how to respond when Hua Chong suddenly bent down on one knee in front of him. Taken aback, he quickly moved to pull him up. He's like, so long, what are you doing? Your Highness, I've been disrespectful, Hua Chong said in a grave voice. He was getting all Wu Ming in that moment. He was like getting down on one knee like Wu Ming and being like, are you going to punish me, Gege? And Shilian's like, what the fudge are you doing? Right? Shilian couldn't get him to stand, so he crouched down as well. How were you so disrespectful, he asked, puzzled. Hua Chong only stared at him. After a few moments, he drew in a soft breath and said in the same grave voice, Please believe me, your highness. I only conceived of this ill plan because I could think of no other solution. I take full responsibility for sculpting that divine statue, but I've never meant any disrespect or acted with the intent to profane your highness's likeness. If your highness feels this method is inappropriate, I'll seek another solution. At last, Shilian finally understood why Hua Chong was acting so solemn. He'd secretly carved so many divine statues of Shilian, and it must have worried him that Shilian found his motivation strange and his behavior offensive. And now, considering his proposed plan, he was probably terrified that Shilin would think that his mind was filled with nothing but obscene fantasies and disrespect. A smile crossed Shilin's face and he let out a sigh. He grabbed Hua Chong with both hands and finally hoisted him to his feet. Of course I believe you. I know you've always respected me, Shilin said. However, Hua Chong's insistence that he'd never acted with such intent to profane was harder to believe. After all, ever since Hua Chong had returned after dissipating into silver butterflies, the man was adamant about profaning his god almost every other day, and he was only growing bolder as time went on. 
I mean, but here's the thing. Hua Chong, one thing that is so amazing about Hua Chong is that he's always wanted to do these things with Xilin. Sure, he's probably had those thoughts, but he never acted upon them or even tried to. He was always so respectful of Xilin. And if Xilin had said no, he would have respected it and been like, okay, and backed off forever, right? Oh my God. But I do like the idea that he's like, ever since Hua Chong came back, he's been all about this. Xilin cleared his throat quietly. This idea, there's there's nothing wrong with it. It's it's very good. Excellent. I mean, you agreed to have sex with him, so. And, uh. When he thought more about what the method entailed, his face grew hot. His words felt very immodest. But now that he'd received Shilian's permission, Hua Chong slowly regained his usual ease. Shilian placed a hand on the Ghost King statue's shoulders. Shall I give it my blessing? Hua Chong blinked and a smile slowly emerged on his face. If Gege wants to, that's more than I could ask for. Shilian nodded. Soon after, the statue lightly arched an eyebrow. Oh, that's so cute! As he withdrew his hand, Shilian couldn't help but smile at the sight. Now it really resembles you! Several figures had slowly approached the cavern. Many of the divine statues had sensed something had come over out of cur- and came over out of curiosity! wanting to get a closer look at this new divine statue that was so different from them. The Ghost King statue also noticed them. It blinked, and its single arched brow arched higher. It seemed like it had some new idea and was searching for something. It took some effort for Shilin to push his own statues out of the door, coaxing and shooing them away. When he slept a glance back, he suddenly asked, Where's the land of the tenders? He was already using the name for the unlucky divine. He was already using that name for the unlucky divine statue. Now, upon the stone altar, there was nothing but a sheer white sheet. Before anyone could notice, the reclining land of the tender's divine statue had vanished without a trace. Oh no, Shilian thought. Hua Chong would followed him over with his hands clasped behind him, frowned. So I have this question. We, I always assumed that, and I'm going to wait and see if this chapter answers it. And if we're going to find out later in either the revised edition or later on in the next extra next week, I don't want to know. But I am curious. I'm just thinking out loud and theorizing. I assumed in the story that what Mu Ching and Feng Shen did not want Shi Lian to see was a mural that Hua Chong had drew of Shi Lian, maybe of him like with Shi Lian in a compromising position. But could it be that it was the divine statue of Shilian and Land of the Tinder and Muching and Function were like, oh, no. Could that have been it? Maybe? Hmm. Okay. So he frowned. Let's hurry and find it. The Cave of 10,000 Gods is massive. It shouldn't be able to escape very quickly, Shilian said. I'm afraid that's not so, Hua Chong said. Gege, look. He pointed at the ground and Shilian had to go around to see the circle array had been carved into the rocky surface by a point by a powerful finger. The teleportation array! It had somehow been able to draw a teleportation array with its bare hands. How much spiritual power had that divine statue drained from him? Shilian was going to collapse on the spot. That divine statue had been poisoned by the land of the tenders, you know. What if it escaped and offended a passing mortal woman? What sort of strange, lurid legends about him would spring from that? He's like, I've already read one pervy storybook about me and Hua Chong tonight. I can't read more. <laughs> when did it escape, he asked. Where did it go? Don't panic, Gege. <laughs> Hua Chong said, think, back then, if you had been poisoned by the land of the tenders, who would you go to first? Well, that actually wasn't too hard to guess. Shilian wasn't all that anxious in the first place, so he swiftly calmed down. Well, it would have been... An incoming line of spiritual communication interrupted him before he could finish. Caught off guard, Shilin raised his hand without thinking to answer the call. And Function's voice immediately blasted Shilin's ears. Your Highness, holy shit, I just saw a monster that's impersonating you. Just as Shilin had expected. Back then, Shilin's most trusted aides were Feng Shen and Mu Qing. They would have naturally been the first ones he'd seek if something like the poisoning incident had happened. Thank goodness the divine statue had gone to Feng Shen first instead of running around the streets. Shilian sighed in relief and quickly started to explain. Oh no, that wasn't a monster, it, and it wasn't impersonating me either. Feng Shen was stunned. Well, what do you mean? It, it's not a monster or an imposter? What, what, is it really you? That can't be. That's not it either, Shilian cried. Anyhow, it's how, it's how is it right now? Did you catch it? Don't let it get away. It's too late, Feng Shen said. It already took off. Well, what? Oh no! Yeah, oh no is right. It's running around naked. 
How outrageous. What do people saw? Function said. Wait, what? Naked? I, I'm not, I mean, it's not wearing clothes? Pretty much, Function said. It's wearing something, but not much. The little clothing that's there is all tattered like someone ripped it up. If it's not a monster or an impersonator, then what is it? What's going on? It looked like a divine statue. Wait, a divine statue? He was suddenly horrified. It didn't escape from that place under the kiln, did it? What were you two doing? Okay, so a couple things. One, um, I've had a lot of people comment since the um, since the end of the Donghua that some people actually ship Xilin and Feng Shen. I don't ship them because I'm like OTP Hualien 1000%. I don't think I could ship Xilin or Hua Chong with anybody else, but I see that ship. So if you ship them, I don't judge. But I definitely will say that of the two, I mean, Muqing's a Cindere, so he's not going to be, you know, up on Xilin like that. But I definitely have noticed throughout the course of this series the loyalty and closeness and relationship that Xilin and Feng Shen have, and it's really, really good, and I like it. But now I'm wondering, also, second thing, Xilin's like, I wasn't that naked during the actual end of the Tinders, and Hua Chong's like... The Kill Bill sirens are blaring. Hua Chong's like, that's because I took some artistic liberties and made you maybe more naked than you originally were. Maybe. We're not going to talk about it. Ah! Shilian couldn't really remember how much he'd been wearing when he was suffering from the poison of the land of the tenders. He had been horribly uncomfortable in that state at that time, so maybe he had stripped off everything in his delirium. I'll explain later, Shilian cried. I'll be there soon. Yeah, I think Hua Chong might have took some artistic liberties and made the statue a little more naked than it originally was, but we're not going to talk about that. Ah! He broke off communication and turned to Hua Chong. Song Long, we need to make a trip up to the new heavenly capital. Next to him, Hua Chong had already collected the newly sculpted Ghost King statue and transformed it into a tiny little idol, small enough to be carried in one's palm. All right! Oh my god, this is amazing. With a few strokes, he drew an array, and the pair made their way directly to the new heavenly capital in no time. They made a beeline for the palace of Nan Yang and saw Feng Shen as soon as they opened the door. When he came face to face with Hua Chong, his eyes bugged out. Crimson rain sought flower, Feng Shen exclaimed in disbelief. How come you're here too? What are you doing up here? Outrageous. A supreme ghost king strolling into the heavenly capital whenever he wants instead of staying in his proper domain? Now come on, Feng Shen. After what happened in this story... Hua Chong ignored him. <laughs> he listened intently for a moment before asking, where's the announcement? The upper court couldn't possibly be going back on its word now, could it? Oh my God! <laughs> I love that, it, I love that there is this semi-nude statue of Xilin in heat running around, mortifying Xilin, functions freaking out. And the first thing Hua Chong is worried about when he gets up there, he's like, did they remember to sound the bells to, to tell how badass I am? Are they, are they keeping their word? Oh my God. Ah! Function knew exactly what Hua Chong meant by announcement. In light of his service in saving the heavens and earth, the upper court had been forced to proclaim and exalt Crimson Rain Stop Flower's heroic deeds for the entire year. The veins on his forehead bulged violently. What announcement? It's the middle of the night. Feng Shen exclaimed angrily. People need to rest too, you know. The announcement only happens during the day. Hua Chong gave a noncommittal, oh, that probably meant he wouldn't pursue the matter further. Oh gosh, whatever, Xilian said. Let's get to the point. Where's the me you saw? Where did it go? It ran that way, Feng Shen replied, pointing in a direction. I was just about to give chase when the two of you ran in here. Xilian had a bad feeling about this. Question, that direction couldn't possibly be toward the palace of Shan Jin. Let's go! Hua Chong's in the dark voice! Oh my god, no, if Mu Ching sees. Oh no, 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 no. The two didn't dare delay. They made a beeline for the palace of Shan Jin and then broke through the front doors and charged inside. Mu Ching was sitting atop the divine altar, stunned like he'd just seen something unbelievable. Shilin went up to him and waved in front of his face. Mu Ching! Mu Ching finally came back to his senses when he saw Shilin. Nevertheless, his expression remained shocked. It took some time before he could manage to demand. Shilian, what were you doing? <laughs> what was I doing? Shilian repeated. I, I don't know. Can you please tell me? Muchin glared at him. Why did you barge into my palace in the middle of the night in a state of undress? Hua Chong narrowed his eye, but Shilian only exclaimed, Oh, don't phrase it so misleadingly. No matter what you saw, it definitely wasn't me. 
Muching put his hand over his face, looking like he wanted to gouge whatever he had seen out of his eyes. Even if it wasn't you, it's got something to do with you. He rebuked with a steely expression. It's that divine statue from the cave, isn't it? What are you two playing at? Letting an indecent divine statue loose and allowing it to run amok in the middle of the night. Do you and Crimson Rain Salt Flower really need to play like that? Oh my god. So officially Mooching and Shilian, not a ship at all. Mooching doesn't even want to think of the possibility of it. Although he does think that Shilian and Mooching, he does think that Shilian and Huachong are up to some kinky stuff in the cave. And he's like, why can't you just do your own business in peace and leave us out of it? <laughs> oh my god. So it is so that was what they didn't want Shilian to see. Huachong scoffed. What's it to you? What's it to me? It's my palace, Mooching cried angr angrily. Well, I played a part in rebuilding the heavenly capital. <laughs> Huachong retorted leisure, retorted leisurely. Mooching was speechless. I love that Huachong is just childish enough to not let that go. At all. It was true. The upper court had suffered catastrophic damage, and plenty of heavenly officials had to secretly ask for help from the master ghost city. The master of ghost city. Huachong had made a, quite a significant contribution to rebuild the new heavenly capital, and that was a fact. We weren't playing. It was an accident, Shilin explained. Where is it now? It stole a sword from me and ran off to... Mooching began, but Shilin knew where to go without him needing to say more. Clanking metal rang from one of the palace of Shan Jin's outdoor gardens. The little ghost king idol Huachong carried with him hopped down on its own and hurried towards the garden in leaps and bounds. Shilin rushed to the garden, and sure enough, the land of the tender statue was standing atop the rockery. The divine statue's tousled clothing revealed large swaths of its smooth shoulders and chest. The clothing below the belt barely covered the essentials, making for an incredibly suggestive sight. The expression on the sculptor's face was also quite a feat of mastery. Its brows were tightly knit, and one could almost see the sheen of sweat and blush on its skin. It wouldn't be a lie to say it had been wrought by the devil's hands. It was using the sword it had stolen from the palace of Shan Jin to stab itself with arduous effort, which was causing the loud clanking noises. Oh, it was trying to detoxify itself the same way Shi Lian had attempted to back then. However, the kiln stone from which it was wrought was formidable, so the sword couldn't penetrate no matter how hard the statue was. The blade eventually was bent with its efforts. Well, if we can't penetrate it with metal. Oh my God. Oh my God. As if it had lost all hope, the statue raised its hand. It was going to smash its own head to pieces. Oh, calm down, calm down, Shilian hurriedly called to it. The divine statue, it's like doing what Muching was doing back in the cave. The divine statue had turned its confused, hazy eyes towards him, and Shilian leapt up to deliver a slap of his own. The statue tumbled inside a hollow cavity of the rockery structure and lay immobile. Oh, good, there's a hollow cavity so that they can go do their business and, and be out of sight, right? Unable to get up. Huachong jarred to Shilian's side and threw something down. It was the Ghost King statue! Or, rather than being thrown, it had actually struggled free from Huachong's clutches as soon as it saw the statue of the young god. Once free of his grip, this ghosting statue transformed back to his tall, slender, full-sized form as it sailed through the air and dropped to land atop the divine statue. A surprise gasp came from below and Shilian promptly jumped off the rockery. It's too late! Sorry, we're gonna borrow your sacred garden for a bit! Oh my god! Mu Ching's garden is being deflowered by a stone statue of Xilin and Hua Chong. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. You can't. Oh my god. Oh my god. He exclaimed as he pushed Mu Ching, who had rushed over to the sound of the commotion, back into the palace hall. Mu Ching was shaken. What are you guys doing? I'll explain some other time. Very sorry. Xilin said he's never going to tell him what's going on in that garden. No. What's there to apologize for? Hua Chong asked slowly and leisurely. You've saved this guy's life how many times now? The tea! The tea! The shade! No, you'd better lay it all out clearly right now, Mu Ching demanded. I saw you throw another you down there. He threw another him down there too, right? My eyes didn't deceive me, so what are you two up to? What's happening inside that rockery right now? Shilian was almost strangling Mu Ching in his attempts to drag it back inside the palace. This is urgent, really, Mu Ching. Don't go over there. Why must you push this? Shilian, Mu Ching roared. 
What are you two doing in my palace? What the fuck? What the actual fuck? It's not us, Shillian exclaimed. It was only an accident. It's really too late. And, and you've caught Function's language again. I wonder how Mu Ching caught Function's language. Being around him a long time? Two hours later. <laughs> The two statues finally exhausted all the spiritual power they'd taken from Shilian and Wa Chong. Shilian put his hand over his face the moment he went inside the rockery for a look. While Hua Chong took while Hua Chong took care of the statues, Shilian went out wordlessly to stop Function and Mu Ching, who both wanted to see for themselves. You two don't want to see it, he said with utmost sincerity. Function wasn't a curious person, so he wisely retreated the instant he got a bad feeling. Good on ya! Mu Ching, however, couldn't let it go. He flung his sleeves wildly and mumbled equally crazily, his face as dark as a pan's bottom. I can't believe this. I cannot believe this. Not only that a thing like this could happen in the first place, it just happened to happen, had to happen in my palace. And then he drifted away like a ghost. He probably would never be able to look at that rockery the same way again. Shilian highly suspected that he would chop it to bits with his bare hands after they left. To be honest, Shilian himself couldn't believe that he'd been the cause of such a funny, mortifying accident. He honestly didn't know whether or not he should feel embarrassed about all this. He turned his head to look at the two statues. No, they should be called one statue. And asked, w will they stay like that? Yeah, let them, Wachong said. It's not like they can be separated now. Shillian covered his face. What heavenly official had statues in a pose like that? It'd be a disaster if anyone saw. It was too indecent and absolutely outrageous. Shillian groaned. Son Long, make sure they're properly hidden. Don't let anyone see them. But of course, Hua Chong replied with a laugh. Oh, don't worry, Gege. <laughs> Oh my god, again, leaving it up to us, the audience, to imagine what that's like, right? They brought the two-as-one statue <laughs> back to the Cave of Ten Thousand Gods, and Shilian wiped the sweat from his face once it was finally returned to its place. The other Shilian statues inside the Cave of Ten Thousand Gods once again surrounded them, curious, but they were once again coaxed and pushed away by the real Shilian. Turn your eyes away from impropriety! Don't look! The statues had no choice but to leave. Although they didn't get to see that divine statue's new and final state, they kept glancing back as they walked away, seeming very jealous that the land of the tenders, Shilian had finally got a companion. The land of the tenders poison had certainly been neutralized, but all the other statues still seemed to be missing out on fulfillment of their own. There was no one to admire the god-pleasing crown prince, no one to lend a hand to the drunk, no one to push the swing. Shilian help, couldn't help but think greedily, if only every Shilian could have a Hua Chong. Unexpectedly, Hua Chong said the same thing aloud. Doesn't Gege think it would be better if every His Highness had a San Long by his side? The two clapped their hands together and immediately set to work, and a great manifestation of their abilities began to unfold within the Cave of Ten Thousand Gods. Soon, Shilian had witnessed the entire process of how Hua Chong transformed a large, heavy rock into an exquisite, expressive stone statue that seemed almost alive. He gets to watch him make it! He gets to, he gets to sit in his art studio and watch Hua Chong make it! It was impossible to describe his technique, since Hua Chong moved so fast, Shilian couldn't even see how it was done. He assumed that Hua Chong had long since merged his sculpting techniques with his spiritual ones, so all that remained was for Shilian to watch in amazement. In any case, in the space of only a moment, Hua Chong turned around and picked up a newly sculpted kid from the pile of debris. The boy had disheveled hair, ragged clothes, and bandages wound around his head. He looked sad and pitiful, and he clutched something in his hands that he refused to let go of. Shilian placed one hand on the little one's head and gave it his blessings, while Hua Chong gave it a little bit of spiritual power. Shortly after, it blinked and started looking around. When it found that someone was dangling it in the air by its collar, it lashed out with a brutal kick. Hua Chong dodged easily like he'd already anticipated the attack and let it struggle and kick in his grip however it wanted. Shilian hadn't expected the little Hua Chong to be so aggressive and couldn't help but chuckle, oh my, so fierce. Hua Chong clicked his tongue and tossed it away. 
Well, the little one fell to the ground with a thud, but it quickly crawled back to its feet and glared at Hua Chong with its eye flashing. Shilin extended a hand to it, worried that it might have fallen too hard. Oh, Sun Long, you're too rough. Careful not to break it, he chided. In a way, this little one had just been born. No matter, Hua Chong said nonchalantly. He's plenty resilient. The kid was vicious as hell towards Hua Chong, but friendly towards Shilin. Shilin beckoned for him to come closer, and he moved to do that, but just then... The God-pleasing crown prince statue sensed something and descended from his position, gazing their way. The moment he saw the God-pleasing crown prince statue, the little one was stunned, frozen in place. His unbandaged eye widened and he hurried over with thumping steps. He, wanted, he clearly wanted to grab the hem of the crown prince's clothing and pounce on him, but at the same time he didn't dare get too close lest he dirty his robes. It was a long time before he extended his arms very carefully and opened his stubborn little fists. There was a single tiny flower hidden in his hands. The God-pleasing crown prince gave the small boy a small smile as he accepted the flower, and then he reached one hand out and picked up the boy, hoisting him up into his arms. The two left happily, just like that. One had finally found someone to admire his sword dance, and one had finally found someone to offer his flower. This is so sweet! Oh my god! Shilin felt relieved as he watched them, but a problem suddenly occurred to him. So long, after you're done sculpting everything, the Cave of Ten Thousand Gods will be filled with so many of our divine statues. Will they begin to mistake who belongs with who? So many of them will look alike, after all. They won't, Wachong replied with a broad smile. Why not? They won't, Wachong repeated with confidence. He raised his eyes to gaze at Shilin, still smiling. Even if your highness mistakes me, I would never mistake your highness. Because a Hua Chong will only ever be the believer of a single highness. He is faithful to his one and only. It will never happen. Soulmates, y'all. The soulmate vibe. Oh my god, yes. Shilian met his gaze with equal intensity. I would never mistake you either, he blurted. There will only ever be a single most devoted believer for a Shilian. I will always remember that. I... He trailed off, suddenly rather embarrassed by his declaration. The two of them were like children, eagerly promising each other. You will always be the only one that I like the very best. While it was sincere, it was incredibly juvenile. And while juvenile, it was incredibly sincere. After a brief silence, Shilian cleared his throat softly. So then, um, next, let's help the Royal Highness on the swing by sculpting a Lord Ghost King to push him. It looks so very lonely and sad without anyone to help push. Sure, Hua Chong replied happily. And then what about the drunk one, Shilian asked. That one's a little troublesome. It seems utterly confused, not to mention it cries. Gosh, there are too many divine statues here. I wonder how long it'll take before all the Ghost Kings are carved. Why worry, Hua Chong asked with a smile. There's no rush. They'll all meet eventually. Shilian also smiled and he nodded. Hmm. They will all definitely meet, he said softly. Inside the stone cave, the two once solitary statues were joined as one. Their gazes and bodies were entangled endlessly in the tight embrace, both staring with rapt adoration at the other face mere inches from their own. They were truly forever inseparable. Oh my God. Oh, oh, these two stories, these two chapters. Oh, I like that. There's such a spiciness to these extras, but then there's so much heart and just reiterating the themes of the story and of them being together. Okay. This picture. Oh my God. So yes, yes. I, if you can see there is the song long pushing him on the swing there is the little one with the bandage offering the flower. There is the land of the tender Shilian, like joined as one with Hua Chong. And then there's, there's a little, a little Hua Chong. They made him a little boy. They didn't make him a ghost fire. They made him a boy grabbing on a Shilian with the liquor bottle. And then there's one of like the soldier with Shilian. Oh, those are so good. I love those drawings. That is so precious. Poor Mu Ching. 
<laughs> Poor Booching. I love that Function caught the drift. Function was like, mm, I think I can read the writing on the wall and I, I really don't want to be here. <laughs> I like the function is functions like nope nope I'm gonna leave now but oh my god the fact that it was Mooching in Mooching's garden these two statues like got it on and Mooching's like I whoa. yeah Shelian is correct he's going to like just tear up that entire garden and be done with it <laughs> so okay so in the in Mount Tonglu it wasn't a mural but it was the statue of Shelian in the land of the tenders that Function and Muqing were like, we don't want Xilian to see this. And what kind of depraved thoughts does Hua Chong have about Xilian? Which, granted, I I would have to go back and reread the Land of the Tenders chapters. I always forgot it was called Land of the Tender. I kept thinking it was Land of the Lustrous, but that's another Donghua series. It's Land of the Tender is different. Um, but I think that maybe Hua Chong made him a little more naked than <laughs> he was originally. But oh my god, these two stories... I, I freaking love the first chapter 250 where it's just the townspeople, the common folk over 800 years have just taken the story of Xilin and Hua Chong and just made the smuttiest fan fiction out of it. And Xilin's like, they've been thinking this this whole time. What? <laughs> but I love how Xilin is, he's opened up <laughs> in more ways than one. I'm sorry. He's opened up in more ways than one. Um, and he's not like, he's fully accepting of himself, but he's accepting of Hua Chong and how they are together. And he has accepted his sexuality. He's accepted who he is, that they can have sex. It's fine. I am sad that MXTX did not give us that wedding night scene. We have to all guess what it was like. We're gonna have to read a lot of fan fiction about that one, I guess. <laughs> But I, I just love the romance between them. It's so beautiful. And these chapters were, uh, honestly, look, I, I liked, I'll have to say, and we still have one more set of chapters next week, right? We only, we have chapter, oh, there's just one chapter. Chapter 252 is the last one. Uh, and it's a pretty long chapter. It's like pages 283 to 328. So it's, nearly 50 pages for that one chapter right so we've got one chapter left to read in this book which is insane to me insane um but that being said um i feel like i like the extras here i think maybe better than modal sushi that's really hard to say i don't know i i'm gonna instantly regret saying that because then i'm like uh i feel like modal sushi modal sushi had a lot more extras than evan official's blessing there were more extras they were longer extras. There were uh, there were some that were really. I feel like maybe Modao Zushi's extras had the good points were better, but overall, I think I'm having I enjoy these overall more as far as extras go. But there were moments in the Modao Zushi extras that I enjoyed more than these. Does that make sense? It's like on the whole, I like these extras a little bit better because of how they're thematically bringing everything together and giving us more with Shilian. And the thing about it is these are giving us more with Shilian and Hua Chong like post in game. Whereas I feel like maybe the ones with Wei Wuxian and... Lam Wanji, some of them are from the past, some of them are side stories, some of them involve like other characters, and I don't know. I'm instantly regretting saying that I like these more because I like Modazushi's the same way. Um, but these are so good too, and I, I love these. And I love how just pouty and Hua Chong's like, but Shi Lian, I'm sick. Won't you read me a story? I don't want to copy calligraphy. <laughs> and then the idea that he gets up to the heavenly realm and he's like, you're not praising me at all hours of the night and functions like effing hell man i just i love it i love it i love it it's so good oh my god and and what i love about this is that Shilin and hua chong he's like this will take us a long time hua chong's like we've got all the time in the world i'm a ghost king that is gonna constantly be reborn over and over again you're an immortal so we got all the time in the world to do this and Shilin's like okay <laughs> I can't believe we only have one chapter left. One chapter. Chapter 252 is next, next week. Um, so, oh my God, these chapters were amazing. I can't wait to hear what you all thought about them because I, MXTX just, I want to go back and reread these chapters because there were some moments like when MXTX gives you that lingering like 
here's this little innuendo, here's this little thing. Think about it for a while. I just want to stare at it and go, what do you mean, you know? So next week, we're going to finish the last chapter and read it. Um, we also are going to look at all the goodies I've got sitting over there on the shelf. All the goodies that came with the special edition, we're going to look at those. Check those out. And then I'm going to show you all an outline of my thoughts of what we're going to be doing from here on in uh, with Heaven Official's Blessing before we start Scum Villain. So that's really exciting to me. Yay. So we'll talk about that next week and do that. Um, in the meantime, since the Dongwa has ended, there's going to be, uh, actually speaking of Modao Zushi, there's going to be another Modao Zushi extra that I believe um, is going to be, is it? Is it going to be this week? It's going to be this week. So look at you all. You guys get the extra. The extra goodies is going to come later today. Speaking of Modao Zushi, uh, that's going to come later today. And then we'll be doing some stuff with the audio drama. So, But in the meantime, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe. Take care. And yeah, I'll be back very soon to talk about some more of Heaven Officials Blessing. Bye.